All right. I know, full house. That really doesn't matter because we know there's lots of people out there in television land. So let's see. I think I covered... Oh, yeah. I'm going to answer a question from the hmm papers. Things that make you go hmm. So this week we're looking, or actually today we will be looking at self-care and self-transformation. Now, how you do this, first, your self, first the self-care part. You want to take care of at least the physical basic, basics. Now, whether you're insured or not, you know what these are. Like I was at the dentist this morning and, you know, partially because of my health conditions, I tended to have bleeding gums, which can mean you can get an infection, which can kill your heart, blah de blah de blah de blah So brushing twice a day, flossing at least once a day is good dental health. So in other words, self-care is first the physical basics, nutrition, hydration, cleanliness, oral hygiene. I got reminded of that today. I'm doing good, so all right. Then the emotional and mental basics. Making sure you're emotionally healthy and mentally healthy, depending on what that means for you, because some people are um, you know, on stabilizing medications and all that. Then, uh, spiritual basics, though you could take care of those first. I do try and meditate before breakfast, uh, at least 12 minutes a day. Try and believe at least six impossible things before breakfast, like Lewis Carroll says. Remember that, the Red Queen and Through the Looking Glass? Because things are not always what they seem. So let's answer a hmm paper question. So this person, one of your classmates, gave up caffeine for a week. Now this illustrates what I've been talking about, about drugs enter our lives in lots of different ways, and it's very subtle. Unless you're really paying attention, they can slip stuff by you. So caffeine is the xanthine, and what xanthines are is they're vegetable-based stimulants. Stimulants, basically the chemical name xanthine means that they're yellow. Not sure what yellow looks like in a dark brown, nearly black liquid, but whatever. Okay, xanthines. It's found in coffee. Its cousins, theophylline in tea and theobromine in chocolate, are cross-tolerant. We learned that. We'll learn a little bit more about that. What that means is that they develop tolerance for each other, even though they're different. Okay, and you build tolerance to them, right? So definitely sometimes if I want to, you know, I know not to, if I want to get a full night's sleep, don't drink coffee after five or seven or whatever. And sometimes even if I substitute to like an Earl Grey, well, that can keep me wired till three, even though it's less caffeine. Well, it's still got theophylline in it, right? And definitely I don't do chocolate. All right, so they're all cross tolerant. So they're all vegetable-based stimulants. So decaf simply means that some of the caffeine has been removed, right? Duh, obviously, but huh? Not all of it. No. Usually, for example, if the Swiss water process is used, they basically wash some of the caffeine oil off the surface of the bean that came out of the. I don't know if you've ever seen coffee in the wild, but. I have in Hawaii, Kona, right? It's a red berry. Um, and uh, they come out green, and you roast them to bring out you know, some of the oils, et cetera, et cetera. And the Swiss water process washes some of the surface caffeine off. That's in the oil. So it doesn't take out all the caffeine, just the stuff that you can wash out unless there's another chemical process that I don't know about, which is possible. So 
Decaf means some of the caffeine has been removed, but obviously not all of it because it still works, right? So, removing part of one active ingredient from a plant-based drug does not eliminate the other drugs in the plant. Does this make sense, right? I mean, you would think that would be obvious, but it, you know, people don't think in those terms, right? They're not suspicious drug counselors who pay attention to, you know, health, my health food store friends who are, are like biological nerds who work in the vitamin se section at Sundance and, oh, did you know? I didn't. <laughs> there is an opiate endorphin-like analog in coffee. So opiate endorphin. Endorphin is the chemical that you make in your body, right? It's a response to pain. It actually changes your emotional response to pain. So it's not, opiates are made by the opium poppy, but this is just to give you the idea that many plants make some of the same chemicals that we make because they're DNA-based forms of life, and so sometimes the answer to communicate between cells is the same within plants and within animals, right? So there's an endorphin analog in coffee. Now, this was reported, my friend... Um, from, who works at Sundance, who does, he's in their IT department, but, you know, work, you know obviously knows, he says, um, this was reported in the journal Nature in the 80s, but then not followed up, because think about what that would mean. If you report in a scientific journal that there's an opiate-like sub substance in caffeine that makes it more addictive, what do you think is going to happen with sales of coffee? Yeah. So, yeah, you can report it in the journal Nature, but nobody's going to fund a study to, okay, well, how addictive is caffeine? Hmm, they're not going to say that. So when I give you an assignment, try and give it up for a week, and then this person reported, oh, wow, I'm throwing up. Oh, wow, I have a headache. Like, you know, I get headaches from you know, going off caffeine unless I'm doing something like exercise, hydration, certain yoga exercises, and then I can actually, or get sick and don't drink, you know, because the flu covers up the caffeine withdrawal because I already feel miserable, right? So basically, since that study wasn't followed up and was just mentioned once, so it's basically part of what would make you feel good after drinking it. So when you stop, you go into withdrawal, right? Headaches, nausea, vomiting in the case of your classmate. Now, most of us don't go through that. Some folks might. Now, she didn't say what her dosage was. She didn't say any of that stuff. I know, for me, what a bad caffeine habit is, is to... This is when I first got... Uh, diagnosed with diabetes is I was basically bookending my day with double espresso mochas. And then the one in the evening, I could fall asleep on it in an hour. So what caffeine does works on your adrenal system and it raises your sugar. But if your sugars are high to begin with, that part of it doesn't work for you. Okay, so, so symptoms in her case, this basically faded. So the nausea and the vomiting happened on the first day uh, and started fading on the second day. So, yeah, there is a physiological basis for that, right? Now, not well reported, not well studied, and you can see why that would be, be the case. We have tons of data on tobacco, right? But, you know, even in the 80s, they were basically describing that there is like 85 billion cups of coffee served in a year on the planet in the 80s. So <laughs> just think, you know, all the Starbucks and all that kind of stuff, right? So coffee isn't heroin after all. So, all right, there's probably worse things to be strung out on, you know, right? But, yeah, why hide that? So, no, you weren't crazy going through that. Definitely not. There's definitely a physiological reason. So I'm just saying, 
be careful about, you know, when you give something up, right? Don't be surprised if you have certain symptoms, especially emotional ones, and that's all part of the process. So, yeah. So let's talk about drug interactions just as we were uh, the other day. So additive is what I like to talk about, drug one plus drug two. So two or more different drugs in different drug categories, which means they're affecting different neurotransmitter systems simultaneously, and they also act on different parts of the brain and the nervous system. So one of the things that we often have to watch out, especially with civilians, if one is good, then two is better, and five is even way better, right? And so what the issue with polypharmacy, that is, many drugs at once, is people will actually take combinations to achieve a particular state. All right, so caffeine and alcohol. Now, this is a bit dated, but it's coming back. And so in the old days, when I was a teenager, we understood that you don't, you know, this is like the 50s, 60s, and 70s, so they were saying you know, uh, giving people a pot of coffee to sober them up when they were drunk. Well, that doesn't work. And the reason that doesn't work is because alcohol being a central nervous system depressant and caffeine being a stimulant, they're working on different parts of the brain. So alcohol depressing general arousal and caffeine is working on the part of the brain that is arousal. So essentially, in effect, you're awake for the accident. So, combining Red Bull and vodka, uh, no. Or, you know, the Four loco drinks with, you know, caffeine or Red Bull, you know. No, that doesn't work. You're, and so that stuff has come around. Now, those drinks didn't exist 30 years ago because we knew, look, don't drink coffee. Just don't drink that much or, you know, have time or take a taxi or whatever. But now... Um, Younger folks, younger than me, basically, you know, doing, you know, the Red Bull and, you know, the caffeine thing. And, yeah, you're awake for the accident. Marijuana and caffeine. So a euphoriant and a stimulant working on different parts of the brain. So, for example... Um, Back in my early jazz or musician days when I was basically just jamming with myself or not playing, because I basically, my basic rule was, you know, don't get stoned before rehearsals or gigs, but if you're by yourself and you're jamming, you know, this led to an embarrassing incident in high school. My father found me playing guitar in the closet. It was a wooden closet, right? I thought I was all alone, right, playing guitar, and, you know, the pot seemed to make the guitar sound better in the wooden closet. Like, Mark, what are you doing in the closet? It's the sound, boy. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> jamming. So the pot puts your brain in a solid alpha rhythm, which is good for free associating and jamming. So when people say, yeah, it does enhance my creativity, it does enhance a brainwave state in which you free associate. Yeah. Right. Lady Gaga, lots of folks say that, right? Well, then she came out saying that she was going to try to write music not on drugs. Yeah. To prove that she is skilled enough to do it. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, so she's working off that same basic meme, which we'll be talking about, right? That, oh, it helps me create better. Sure. What's your definition of meme? Because, like, online... We, we, will, we will be doing that okay. later today. All right, so the pot causes you to free associate because it puts your brain in a solid alpha rhythm. Um, and then so that, uh, so combining that with like a double espresso mocha, so the caffeine cuts the down of the pot. The pot cuts the edge off the caffeine. If you use chocolate, chocolate and marijuana have similar ingredients in them in terms of working the anandamide pathway. So it reinforces the, each other. So multiple drug effects. So I'm saying polypharmacy works for specific reasons, right? So pot cuts the edge, caffeine cuts the down. 
Same thing, and so you, and adding a no, uh, chocolate and the nandamide cuts in. So I mean, this is a common uh, drug combination. Particularly, this is why, for example, you know, Alice B. Toklas, if you're you know old '60s person, know you know marijuana brownies. This is why marijuana brownies works. The THC and the anandamide analog in the chocolate reinforce each other, and eating it extends the high and makes it a more physical high rather than a head high. Speedballs or parachutes, uh, the two different names. So speedballs is cocaine and heroin. Uh, parachutes, uh, one version of parachute because it changes regionally. I mean, there are websites where you can see drug slang where, you know, parachutes is an old name for coke, uh, methamphetamine and heroin. So coke has a shorter drug half-life than meth, right? So the coke cuts the down of the heroin, the heroin cuts the edge off the coke, so you see people doing that in combination. Uh, people doing um, heroin and meth, meth has a longer drug action, so you're up and you kind of like float down like a parachute with a longer drug action than the cocaine. People who were into that. So same idea. Heroin cuts the edge. The stimulants cut the down. Heroin cuts the edge off the stims. The stims cut the down of the heroin. So when you see people doing polypharmacy, this is they're seeking for a state in between those different things those different drug categories. So additive, so two different drug categories where both the drug effects are not canceling each other out. They're both in existence. So another one, potentiating or synergistic. Two different words, potentiating or synergistic, uh, basically is the same thing, it's a multiplicative effect. So you like to think of it as like two times three, not like one times three or one times two, multiplicative. So alcohol with nearly anything else, particularly downer drugs like sedative hypnotics or opiates in particular, and other synthetic sedative hypnotics, so your benzos, major tranquilizers, halcyon, Xanax, Valium with alcohol, and opiates. So shows clearly on, the, uh, on pharmaceutical warning labels, do not drink alcohol with this. Here's why, okay? We, not, we usually talk about alcohol metabolism in uh, the pro class, but just so you know, as civilians, well, how this works. Alcohol is essentially an inverted sugar. So yeasts eat the sugar in grains and fruits and they shit alcohol, right? So this happens naturally until the alcohol kills whatever bug is making the alcohol, right? The back it just kills them. So usually this happens at around beer and wine strength alcohol, like at about 12 to 19%. And that's usually as strong as you can get without distilling. What distilling does is then burn off the water so that you concentrate the alcohol. So here's what happens in the liver. The liver has an enzyme. Enzymes break down things. So alcohol dehydrogenase is made by the liver. Literally, this is what it does. It breaks off hydrogens from alcohol, right? Now the first breakdown product from the alcohol that the liver makes is even worse than the alcohol. It's like acetylaldehyde, which is like a couple of hydro groups away from being formaldehyde. Don't want to discuss the chemistry, but it's bad stuff. You know, if you remember in high school biology, frogs in formaldehyde and embalming fluid, right? So that's what's happening to your liver. So certain drugs, if you remember your basic definition of drug, Drug is a substance that changes the normal function of living tissue. Antabuse, or disulfiram, that drug 
stops the breakdown process of alcohol at acetaldehyde. And that's the way it works for most folks. So essentially, you get sick if you're taking your antabuse and drinking on top of it because all of a sudden you have a system full of acetaldehyde, which makes you throw up and et cetera. So the liver works on alcohol before anything else and until it's gone. So essentially what happens, and this is part of the effect of alcohol, when you drink it, the body goes on red alert, and that's part of the initial stimulation. Wow, we got to deal with this stuff. So you feel buzzed, right? Because the brain doesn't feel pain. It just basically loses, loss of fu it loses function, right? So you don't feel that you're toxic. You just feel high, tipsy, whatever. And basically, it takes at least twice as much water to break the alcohol down as then you drank, than, than is in, in the alcohol, which is why you're dehydrated, which is why you get headaches in terms of a hangover, extreme dehydration after drinking. So if you drink a lot of water after drinking, would that... Well, what I... Naturally, what I tell people is you won't get less drunk, but if you drank twice as much water by volume, so if you drank a beer, a pint of beer, and drank two pints of water, that might help. You wouldn't be less drunk, but that would contribute to you drinking less because you're full. Right. And so then you wouldn't get hungover. Yeah, potentially. I mean, that's how I've experienced it, okay. right? I've experienced it that way. Assuming as right. much, you right. wouldn't have something to contribute that much to a hangover. Right. Okay. Hangover is a com basically an alcohol overdose without compensating for the dehydration. Okay. That's one part of it. Right. So, the liver works on the alcohol before anything else, and until it's gone, because remember, the liver works on all drugs. But if it's ignoring all drugs in the presence of alcohol, then toxic levels of the other drugs are building up which is why you don't mix them. That's why they suggest doing that. Because, as an example, um, I don't know that you're old enough to remember Iran-Contra. That was kind of like about the time many of you were born. But if you do remember that, um, yeah, we're selling arms to Iran. We're dealing drugs to gang members and sending the money to the Nicaraguan Contras under the Reagan administration, et cetera, right? So uh, Robert McFarlane, who was the national security advisor, was going to be testifying before Congress, and he took 30 Valium. 30? The night before. Yeah. Yeah. Took 30 Valium. Now, didn't kill him. He was just asleep. So here's the thing with that, right? If, that, if he did that, Here's what a drug counselor knows. All right. Benzodiazepines are like alcohol in a pill form as far as their effect on the brain. If you can take 30 Valium and it doesn't kill you, that means you have a whopping alcohol tolerance. <laughs> right? Because we know people who work in the White House are probably heavy drinkers, right? You know, only Chip Carter talked about smoking pot on the White House roof with Willie Nelson, so I'm not going to assume that Jimmy and Ro I'm not going to assume Jimmy and Rosalind were tokers, and who knows what Obama's doing, but hey. The idea is, if he had drunk on top of that, those 30 Valium, that would have killed him. Right? So, hence, that's why the warning, do not take this drug with alcohol. There's that's the physiological reason for that. So drug interactions, and this is basically five types of drug tolerance uh, with cravings and withdrawal. So metabolic tolerance. So the body breaks down the substance, that is, metabolizes it, gets better at it, with continued exposure to the substance, and this is why you don't get as high or drunk. This is a simple explanation. Why you don't get as high or drunk with time and why you have to use more. So 
so you metabolize it. With continued exposure to the body, oh, we know this stuff, okay? Because the body's designed to learn and remember, right? So it does. Metabolic tolerance sets up behavioral tolerance. That is, in the continued presence of the drug, you can, as we used to say in the old days, maintain and act normally, quote unquote, function to outward appearances while under the influence. So yeah, you know, in Amazing Dope Tales, sure, I could drop acid and have Thanksgiving dinner with my parents. The turkey was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you learn to ignore the hallucinations, it's okay. Sort of. <laughs> All right, but this is when we're people talking about holding their liquor, right? So part of the piece and you know part of the drawback with not having breathalyzers and bars is OLCC regs, just like anywhere else, you're not going to serve to anybody visibly intoxicated. But what's that mean? You don't know how loaded they are, and serving them till they're more visibly sloshed is like. All right, so metabolic tolerance sets up behavioral tolerance, which sets up tissue tolerance. And what that means is the body needs the substance to function normally, and without the substance goes into withdrawal, which is the body's attempt to return to normal non-drug functioning. So one of the critical signs of tissue tolerance is you go into withdrawal. So what this means then is, yes, you can't, what people don't understand, for example, about junkies or what we'll call functional alcoholics is, yeah, you can be sloshed, but that's because the nervous system has adapted to your use and you can perform within a narrow framework of what that means. So the classic, in, in my experience, just to give you an example of high stress occupations in the entertainment industry, culinary, et cetera. I'll just talk about this producer I worked with in LA producing you know, a demo. So this guy's normal fee was $1,500 a day, which is kind of standard at that level. Um, he um, had produced a number of albums that, uh, of some of my favorite artists. And so he came well recommended by my manager. And basically, he cut his fee, he said to me, for, uh, to $150 a day. And um, then whatever studio time cost, which I think was like 25 and then you know, paying studio musicians, et cetera, et cetera. And here's what his fee was, besides the money. Two six packs of St. Polly Girl Dark. I, he was very specific about that. And so we spent the weekend together, right, with our mutual girlfriends. And so I watched him. He consumed the first six pack before he got out of the house. Two, six, two, two beers to get out of bed, two in the shower with him, two over breakfast. That's the first six pack. And then over the course of the day, he just did a maintenance dose. And because he was this big time Hollywood producer, people brought him Jacks and Coke. And, you know, but, but my part was just the, you know, paying him cash and St. Pauli Girl, two sixes of St. Pauli Girl Dark. Now, behind the boards, he was amazing. <laughs> Calling the shots, you know, mixing, fading, and be calling his friends to come in and, you know, work on my project, et cetera, et cetera, at reduced rates. I mean, it was great, but I was not a drug counselor then, so I didn't know what I was seeing. And going, wow, okay. I knew that, you know, rock and roll, yeah, people are heavy drinkers and drug users, but this guy, when he didn't have it, he had the shakes and basically took the two beers to stop having the shakes and first six-pack to get out of the, out of the house. And then another 
six pack during the day, plus everything that he could use, right? So tissue tolerance shakes with his withdrawal, right? So there are a lot of people like that who basically they can function within a limited definition of function. But, you know, basically when I've you know, told you about, you know, people drinking a vodka a day, you know, a fifth of vodka a day or whiskey or, you know. And family yeah. Completely, yeah. what, completely normal, dives yeah. straight, right. cooks, takes care of his family, completely goes to work 40 hours a week. Yep. Has so, a yes. Yes, so people can function on it, right? They're still legally drunk. But, and like I said, you know, the police pull over lots of drunk drivers who blow 0.55, which means they, everybody else would be dead and they're still driving. So I'm not saying it can't be done, obviously it can, but at what cost and what happens when your liver starts failing, as an example. So we'll get into that shortly, right? So reverse tolerance, which is a sign of liver damage. Basically what happens is because of acetylaldehyde, among other things, as well as liver cancers, emphysema, all the stuff, you know, when I cited in uh, the social math piece at way at the beginning of class, if you remember, that the alcohol death rate is basically from, so like 150,000 people a year, that's from stuff like liver cancer, cirrhosis of the liver alone. So drunk driving, murders, accidents, that's a separate stat. This is just from drug effect, right? So reverse tolerance, sign of liver damage. There's less liver because it's been destroyed. Therefore, less ability to process the alcohol or other drugs. So you get drunker faster, takes less to get you drunk because you have less liver. Not a good sign. So there are also certain mushrooms that'll do this. Like some people, like we'll get people that die because they eat Amanitas or death angels or whatever, those instantly destroy your liver. Overdoses, because uh, you'll see this in women who remember, in terms of suicide, women will take pills, guys will shoot themselves, so women will take, you know, like acetaminophen, and Tylenol, that lunches your liver. So, reverse tolerance, most frequently we see that with heavy drinking. And cross tolerance. So within a drug class, tolerance to one is tolerance to all. But if you use the most potent in a drug class, that's the level of tolerance you have. Okay, so lower potencies don't affect you. As an example, all right, the gin drinker, okay, would not be able to stand drinking a bottle of wine. It wouldn't even buzz them. And you can see that in terms of dosages. So a fifth of gin is like, uh, it's 25 ounces because it's a fifth of a, ga fifth of a gallon, right? So it's, let's say that's 17 doses, right? So then a bottle of wine at uh, 750 milligrams is basically four or five doses. Five, dose, five or six doses, something like that. Doesn't affect them, even though the volume by liquid is close. Same thing with opiates, same thing with marijuana, same thing with other drugs, basically within that drug class. You'll definitely see this with somebody that's strung on oxys, which is basically like street heroin, except it's synthetic. So, you know, Percocets, Vikes, they need multiple hits of those to make up for the doses that they're at. You can usually tell this, again, this is usually for the pro class, but if you know somebody on the methadone program and they're up to 200 milligrams a day, then that means they had a whopping street habit, and so. Well, for example, they might be addicted to all opiates and way, the way you tell how addicted they are might be what their dose of a pharmaceutical is because you can't tell, you know, like what, how much heroin is that equivalent to. Well, uh, 
we don't have an idea of what the potency of the heroin is unless you're getting from the same dealer, you know, consistent potent, potency and all that kind of stuff. So often times the people I'm seeing who are on the methadone program or substituting with Suboxone take a particular dose to keep from going out there. And if they relapse, they'll have to relapse on, if they're not getting oxys, they're not getting street heroin, then they have to do combinations of lower potency drugs to match the same dose to keep from going into withdrawal. Yeah, Alexandra? All this discussion about making street drugs legal and having them um, provided by the government so that they can manage them and have a certain standard. So the people who are addicted to say, you know, they made heroin and all that stuff legal, if the potency they were getting from the government wasn't enough, would that still provide a black market so that they could get a stronger potency? Good question. So as an example, um, if you import the European model here, there is still a street, you know, so uh, as an example in England, okay, heroin is a legal pharmaceutical drug. In England? In England, okay. yeah. Uh, because it's more potent than, say, methadone, or dolphine as they call it there, because that's where it came from, right? So their strategy is basically, yeah, we will give you pharmaceutical grade heroin for your habit and a clean needle, et cetera, et cetera, and eventually get you off of, get you off of the drugs when you're ready. But until then, getting your dope from the government, getting clean needles from the government solves one problem, but doesn't really deal with the addiction part of it. Right. Right? Okay. So then there's the piece about access to treatment, right? So you know my bias. I'm a treatment professional, and I'm, I'm an abstinence guy. But not everybody's going to go cold turkey. Right. And cold turkey ain't appropriate for everybody. So unless you couple that, get okay, your free heroin from the government, mm -hmm. with treatment on demand, you're working at cross purposes because you haven't eliminated the underground economy element. Okay. So even if they were to make marijuana and harder street drugs legal in the United States, it wouldn't really eliminate the underground economy. My bet is it wouldn't. I'm cynical. I don't think it would either. Yeah. I don't think it will ever go away. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think yeah. if you did it right, you could potentially cut how much of an underground economy there is, but I don't think you'll ever completely get rid of it because you look at alcohol I mean people still get alcohol illegally it's not right. as big of a market as street drugs and things are but there still is one street drugs are a bigger market because they're illegal right I mean so that there's that part of the economic piece so yeah I mean at this level and complexity of society sure it won't ever go away if we had social collapse uh, maybe I'm not hoping for social collapse. I'm just saying that it wasn't always a problem here. It just got to be a problem with a certain level of societal complexity. Which is not to say, you know, I mean, China went through pro alcohol prohibition uh, 10 times in 3,000 years, right? So clearly the lesson there is prohibition by itself doesn't work. You have to basically, that's why I'm such a big fan about, okay, let's do some cultural restructuring. So you understand, okay, and let's start with reducing the amount of pharmacological ignorance there is, because if you're not, if this is the only place you've ever gotten this information in your life, uh, that's dangerous. Well, you know what my opinion is about that, right? So, yeah, it's complex. Um, I wouldn't, I'm personally not for, um, I'm for decriminalization, but I'm also for testing to the level that we know what, how stoned you are and how, if you're too stoned to drive a motor vehicle and having a field sobriety test for that. I'm also into let's test to see which constituents are in which strains so that, okay, if you are doing it medically, we can take a caramel or a ginger candy, my favorite, or jelly bean, whatever, and take that precise dosage for your precise condition, whatever that is. Smoking anything is inefficient as a drug delivery system. It's dumb. 
not really medicine, even though you call it medicine. So if it's not efficient, then how come so many people get addicted to cigarettes? Uh huh. Because, <laughs> well, if they were actually doing the amount of, well, they couldn't eat a nicotine sa salad. There's enough nicotine in them to kill them. Nicotine is an insecticide, right? So there's just enough nicotine delivered in a cigarette because it's inefficient. So if they were to actually physically consume all the nicotine in a cigarette, it would kill them. Yeah. But because they're smoking it, they don't get you that. You lose of most of it in the combustion process. See, that's what they need to tell kids in high school. That, Not yeah. Smoking is bad for you and turns your lungs black. Okay. <laughs> Well, I was at a prevention conference on Friday, Friday, and basically they were trying to say, okay, you know, well, marijuana causes your blood pressure to go up. Uh, right. So d is that really of a concern to a 19-year-old? Nope. No. Okay. So, yeah, that might be physiologically true, but it sounds like a <laughs> scare tactics from the 60s. That's, yeah. they're not buying that, right? I mean, it's like, if I tell the truth about LSD, okay? Physically, it's non-toxic if it's actually LSD at the doses you're taking it. But if you took a gram, that would kill you. But that's 5,000 human doses. Who has that? I mean, who's going to eat 50 sheets of LSD? That's not going to happen, right? But if you tell, oh, well, it's not that the drug itself is dangerous. It's what you might do while you're on it. Well, they think that's even odds. Oh, I might go crazy? Well, I'm already crazy, I'm a teenager. That's even odds. You know, how many people are gonna jump off the Golden Gate Bridge because they're on acid on orange sunshine and they see a seagull flying through the Golden Gate Bridge and decide to take off for it? <laughs> I know somebody who did that. One of seven people survived jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge on acid, amazing dope tales, right? Don't try this at home. Do crazy stuff. All right, so within a drug cross, cross tolerance, tolerance to one is tolerance to all. If you use the most potent in a drug class, that's the level of tolerance you have. Lower potencies don't affect you. So for example, benzodiazepines and alcohol. So notice that benzos are equivalent to drinking because they affect a specific part of the brain, the same part of the brain, and they're smaller doses which means they're more potent than the alcohol because they're concentrated without getting you drunk. I was talking with somebody today, you know, well, I'm going, you know, under the knife at the dentist, you know, having a root canal done and I'm kind of nervous and they were going to give me Halcyon. What's Halcyon? Well, it's a benzo. Bush was on it. It's a side effect that can make you crazy, but probably, you know, if you're nervous at a root canal besides all the stuff that they're giving you, you know, I mean, I had Versed for my eye surgery. Like, right, I need a benzo because they need me awake. And this benzo makes me not care that sharp objects are coming towards my eye and sticking into my eye. It was kind of a trip. You know, local anesthetics didn't hurt, but it's like, this is psychedelic, dude. Weird, right? But... Benzos and alcohol. So they're both sedative hypnotics, cross tolerant. Ritalin, benzodrine, amphetamine, methamphetamine. So lower, lower potency to higher potency. Meth is at the extreme end relative to Ritalin. Adderall and methamphetamine are the same thing. So the difference between Adderall and methamphetamine obviously is that Adderall is pharmaceutical methamphetamine. Uh, but street meth basically uses different concentrations than the drug does, than the f big pharma drug does. Should be one on opiates, right? Maybe not. Yeah, well, same thing with opiates. Oxys and heroin, fentanyl at the extreme right end, Percocets. Uh, Darvon, Demerol's, the lower end, Delouded towards the heavier end. So withdrawal is generally the opposite of the drug effect. Now remember, 
All drugs have effects, plural. You develop tolerance for separate drug effects at separate rates. So different drug effects at different rates, separate ones at separate rates. They all develop tolerance separately, whatever they are. Cravings. These are persistent thoughts around using or repeating an addictive process. So originally cravings was, for example, um, did we do the fire engine thing in here? I don't remember. Fire engines are red. I don't know. That sounds kind of familiar. Can, I think you keep going. I think you might have. Okay. But you can do it again. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. Because I think you did. But Why are fire engines red? Well, everybody knows that five, three times four is 12. There's 12 inches oh. in a ruler. Queen Elizabeth, she was a ruler. She had ships to sail the sea. In the sea, there are fish. The fish have fins. Fins follow the Russians. And that's why fire engines are red, because they're always Russian. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. So, cravings. Let's take cocaine. Radio tagged cocaine in experiments. So what that means is they put an isotope in the cocaine, you snort it, which part of the brain does it go to? It goes directly to, so cocaine, all cane drugs, are local anesthetics. That means they stop pain signal right where they are injected. That's why at the dentist you get lidocaine, benzocaine, okay? You're stopping pain signal right there. Right? But that's the effect of cane drugs, but they have effects in other parts of the body because whatever you inject into your body is quickly distributed all around your body in 30 seconds. So, cocaine, whatever you inject into your body is distributed because of your circulation in 30 seconds. You have a complete circulation in 30 seconds through your heart from one point to another, any point in the body, through the heart. Definitely inside of a minute. So would that be the fastest way to get any drug in your system? Is like Smoking. Smoking is fast. Yeah. Why? All, if it's a psychoactive drug, and this is why uh, you ask, so I'll tell you, right? It's usually the pro class because this is why under, you need to understand why people smoke or shoot something, okay? You shoot something, it goes into a vein, venous blood is going directly to the heart and being distributed around the body inside of 30 seconds. That's why the rush happens in 10 seconds when you're shooting something. Smoking something, the blood from the lungs, because 80% of the body's oxygen being taken by the brain off the top. So when you smoke something, that's going directly to the brain. So as far as psychoactive drugs are concerned, smoking them is a more efficient way to get high. That's why smoking crack or smoking heroin or smoking meth gets you higher faster smoking than shooting. But also because of this, physiologically, Smoking any of those drugs is as bad, if not worse, than shooting. But since you're smoking, would you have to consume more of the drug? Um, it's a toss-up because mo you lose about 60% of whatever drug is there by smoking. Okay. So that means even though it's less amount, more of it's going to the brain. So you get higher faster. Yeah, it's like 40 to 60 percent loss, roughly. All right, so where I was going with this, right? Cocaine. Cocaine, radio tag cocaine goes directly to the nucleus accumbens, which is the brain reward center, right? So it's a local anesthetic everywhere else, but in the brain, it basically involves the dopamine pathway so that Anything that is connected or associated in your mind with pleasure, it triggers, right? So that's why even though it seems off the wall, you know, three times four is 12, 12 inches in ruler, 
that sounds crazy and off the wall until you get to the punchline. The association with cocaine, every time you get stoned, you have an experience that goes into memory, right? So cocaine's really expensive. So where do people get their money? Oh, the sight of money is a trigger, triggers cravings. ATM triggers cravings. My dealer has a candy blue Mustang. Blue cars are a trigger. White picket fence, trigger. I had sex on cocaine. Anybody that I have the hots for that is all attractive, trigger. So there's multiple environmental triggers triggering cravings, and what cravings are psychologically are persistent thoughts around using or repeating an addictive process. So you keep thinking and thinking and thinking, I want it, 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 unless you've been taught to interrupt that process. I mean, we don't teach mind control, right? So, oh, how do you interrupt persistent thoughts? Shut up, shut up. <laughs> no, right? So that's what cravings are, right? Now, the reason I went through this whole thing, okay? Because of the mind-body splint, I'll use the simple term, there's a longer term for it, right? Is the brain, the brain is an organ of the body, yes? It's part of the body. But is the mind part of the body? Okay, cocaine is not addictive to the body. It's addictive, it produces cravings in the brain. So it causes the brain, because it's intense pleasure, to keep thinking about it over and over and over. And it's just a thought, right? You're not going through physical withdrawal, per se. So cra cravings are persistent thoughts. So I'm just saying that, yeah, withdrawal is when your body is physically going through pain, et cetera, et cetera. With cocaine withdrawal is not withdrawal, it's cravings. They're not physical sensations. So you see the challenge here. It doesn't mean it's any less addictive. Say, you, know, you do have a physical withdrawal from tobacco, from nicotine. People do get shaky, irritable, emotional, et cetera, et cetera. It's not just cravings. You are actually withdrawing from this metabolic poison. Essentially, that's activating uh, or on the acetylcholine pathway. So cocaine withdrawal produces cravings in the body, cravings in the brain, not necessarily withdrawal in the body. Yeah? Doesn't the craving only last like a certain number of seconds or something like that? that yes, and till the next thought. And then keep, you keep thinking, right? So if you translate this to other processes, like gambling, like porn, like anything that involves a pleasure pathway or a brain reward pathway will produce this effect. Cravings. I'm really jonesing for a poker game or video poker or, yeah. Okay, so part, partial cure, control the thought waves of the mind. That's from Patanjali, the yoga guy from 3,000 years ago. Hence, uh, breath work, mantra, other practices of awareness and refocus are often used as part of uh, the recovery process. And basically time away, abstinence long enough to be able to create a new habit of not using. 30, 60, 90 days, roughly. On the way to a year, just like we were talking about the other day. Not even serious from meth unless you've been continuously absent for three years, period. Other drugs are similar, but basically DSM, you know, under a year is pretty much shaky. So yeah, we can give the 30-day coin and the, you know, three, six year coins in 12-step program, but you're basically just on the way. 
why we don't let them become people, addicts become drug counselors until five years of complete abstinence. If they're in recovery. So, the transformation part. Wow, in 23 minutes. All right. So, changing from this to that or enhancing this, not that. So, what are the memes that influence you or that you need to acquire? So naturally, they thought I was crazy about this when I first started talking about this after the concept was first published in the late 80s. Oh, well. It works. So mimetics. Exploring and creating viruses of the mind. So the idea is this. Meme, M-E-M-E, meme, like cream, is to gene. A gene is the smallest unit of replicating physical life. A meme is the smallest unit of replicating thought. Now this came from a, bi this whole meme, if you will, came from a biologist, an atheist biologist, actually a radically atheist biologist. And you've got to prove stuff to them, folks. So meme is like a virus of the mind. And that, when you, if you Google the term, that's probably the most popular definition you'll find. So when people want to change or people have these thoughts, they have these concepts like, you know, what is your gender expression? What does it mean to be male? What does it mean to be female? What does it mean to be this, that, and the other class? Where'd you get the idea? Where is that idea? What's brand loyalty? Well, brand loyalty is a meme. I like this particular brand of whatever. I used to be a Martin man. I still have a Martin, but, you know. Now I'm a Taylor guitar player and have a couple of Gibsons. I'm getting a Fender Strat, right? All professionally known level, professional level instruments because I like pro gear, right? I'm not a hobbyist. Get paid, right? So, but that's a meme. What is professional? So like genes, memes combine to become viral ideas. So our phrase in popular culture, when something goes viral, this came from memetics, which Dawkins basically first published in like 86. In his book called The Selfish Gene. And he's basically, the reason the book is called that, he says, genes want to replicate themselves. They will do anything to do that. They don't care. He said, like, for example, uh, other than prions, let's say viruses. A virus don't care. It will infect. All it wants to do is replicate itself. That's all it does. So viruses can actually be, they're fairly selective, but they evolve and they mutate. And that's the idea that he's talking about. So meme... A meme is a virus of the mind which can infect an open mind and begin replicating. So to do this, you need to understand the difference between viruses and bacteria to, to get what he's talking about. Viruses can only infect cells, like bacteria and stuff like that. Thing. They have their own DNA, but they, in order to replicate themselves, they need the machinery of a cell to infect. A meme being a virus of the mind needs a mind to replicate. Okay, as the smallest unit of replicating thought, a meme can have an influence beyond its small size. In fact, with some of the things that they're doing with distributed intelligence now in computing, where they're looking at social insects as the model, as the meme. An individual honeybee 
is pretty dumb. But with a swarm, that intelligence is multiplied thousands fold. And so they learn this from like watching ants do patterns that are seemingly random, but um, a man, ant basically lays a trail that says yes, no, or follow me, or don't follow me, or whatever, and they can basically achieve amazing feats as if there was a single intelligence that's way smarter than all of them together. Right? So, memes are transmitted through any form of human communication, language, images, art, technology, beliefs, spirituality, religion, politics. So, once you understand the concept, you can kind of detect memes in operation and also cause a few of your own. That's what I mean by mimetic engineering. Oh, that's where this idea came from. Do I believe this or should I question it? And where did this come from, this idea, this concept? So, for example, <clears throat> Isms are mimetic patterns of discrimination. So, for example, take the U.S. Constitution, which is the basis of all law in the United States. In the U.S. Constitution, females are inferior to males. Blacks are three-fifths of whites. Rich are greater than poor. This is all in the Constitution. All men are created equal does not mean all human beings are equal under the U.S. Constitution. And the U.S. Constitution is not the oldest form of democracy here, but that's what we've been taught in the particular meme of Western democ democracy. So there was actual democracy in 1100 here on this continent. There were no concepts of illegal aliens before the United States was formed. The democracies among the Native Americans who knew about Europeans, knew about Africans, knew about Chinese, uh, you're welcome to come here as long as you're respectful and want to help build a nation. Otherwise, you're not illegal. Right? So, countering a meme as an example. So, obviously, I, you know, I don't necessarily believe the stuff in the Constitution, in the Constitution before the Bill of Rights, but those, those are the, I can point to you to the articles where this, these beliefs are there. Females less than ma males, blacks less than whites, rich or greater than poor. It's all in there. Who's a citizen as far as the Constitution is concerned before the Bill of Rights? Rich, white, landowning males. Are those the only human beings on the continent? Uh, no. All right? So, countering a meme constructed of lies with the truth is a partial response. So, for example, for every virus is that infects a particular organism, that organism, organism creates antiviruses, or, and they're all viruses that compete. So you can have counter-virus and anti-virus, or basically memes and counter-memes. I mean, you can play with that idea. You also can create an environment where, tr where, where truth memes will flourish. So this is one of the things with mimetics, is what Dawkins will say, there's no such thing as a good meme and a bad meme. It's all about success. Is it a successful meme or not? Because people can believe stuff that ain't true. And he's an atheist, so he thinks any religion ain't true. Show me where God is. Can't, uh, don't exist. If you can't express it in numbers, it don't exist. You can't replicate it in a laboratory. It don't exist. All right. And, you know, as a person of faith, like, okay, I'm not believing in something that doesn't exist. I can demonstrate it, but... Maybe you don't accept that as evidence. That's okay. I know what I experience. 
And he said, fine, that's your experience, but how do you know? Show me. Yeah, you survive a slave ship, Richard? Because... <laughs> so, in addiction, simply getting someone clean and sober, that's one meme, 12-step meme, is not enough. Okay, without counteracting the memes and programming that cause them to seek addiction as a coping strategy, they often substitute other addiction patterns. Now, that statement is a meme by itself. And where it's coming from is, remember, we were talking about the five cultural modes of addiction. I'm starting from the third meme, that is, addiction is maladaptive behavior, and combining it with the African meme which says, okay, you got to know the history of the drug that you're taking and where it got used in its original culture and was it addictive in its original culture? And if it wasn't, either stop using it or use it non-addictively the, like the way the culture that generated it did. Okay, so like if you're Irish and you use whiskey. Okay, so you follow the model of the wise women who say, we only drink this in ceremony. If you're an adult, if you're not pregnant, and you still have to remember who you are. So you're not getting sloshed because you're not using outside of a ceremony. And by the way, nobody makes whiskey until everybody has bread first. Right? So there's limits. So you're not getting totally sloshed or berserk. Right? So that's one pattern with that one particular drug. So memes, uh, if, you're for, if you're a visual learner, right? Smallest unit of replicating life, transmitted through any cultural mode of communication. It combines to find viral ideas which can mutate over time or given diverse environments. So for example... Jingles, things that go viral on the net, cliches, technology. And I originally designed this for gangs, basically to explain in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, look, there's something that's happening with these street gangs. They're evolving faster than you're able to deal with them, and your working theories are not working. And what I mean by that is like, look, in the 90s, if 80% of the street gangs in Oregon are white kids who are following basically a black urban gang meme, they're listening to rap music and they're drinking 40s and they're doing drive-bys, and we're talking like Omaha, Nebraska, as well as Eugene, Oregon, uh, and this is with no contact with minorities except through the media, boom, media is spreading the meme, these kids are acting it out. Yeah. And then they do it. Right. Because they don't really know what being in a gang is about. Right. Welcome to gangs and mutants. Yeah. So, I mean, again, it's mutated, right? So that they feel like they have more to prove because, right. And this is also why, you know, this is what gets scary for some folks is like, okay, you get white kids who are from law enforcement families from like the rich part of towns and they're the, some of the most dangerous gang members. Well, will a mostly white police force do gang suppression, urban style gang suppression on their kids? No. <laughs> Will they necessarily, well, they're not listening to me, but fortunately I'm broadcasting. So. Well, were you on the, uh, gang task force? At the At the current moment, I'm a co-chair of the gang task force, which is... especially yeah. around train song park and stuff right. like that. Right. Um, has that gotten better? Depends on who you talk to, yes and no. Generally, no. Generally, no, okay. Yeah. Because I live over in that side of town, yeah. so. All right, there's still activity there, and yeah, All right. Because, you know, I don't know. I, I know what I would do if I were going to apply this approach. They're not doing it yet, so... All right, so memes <coughs> accrete. This is actually a term from um, astronomy. 
So after the Big Bang, when planets in the solar system started forming, basically matter accretes to form the sun, the planets, you know, gathers more material, gets bigger. So memes accrete. They combine and they grow, become viral ideas, and thus can take on a whole life of their own once they find new environments. So for example, this, you know, what they used to call black style gangs, but if 80% of the kids in them are white, then you can't call it black style. And they said it was LA style, which, okay, that's, you're not saying anything different, but LA isn't, Eugene is in LA, but there are some common elements. So they can change according to their environment. So for example, you can have Tongan and Samoan Crips and Bloods in Tonga and Samoa, as well as Seattle. You can have uh, Crips and Bloods on Navajo reservations where there definitely aren't any black people and the only connection is basically satellite TV. So yeah, I can prove that this works in terms of understanding it. So how you change. So good, memes aren't good or bad, they're successful or not. This is straight docs, Dawkins. Okay, as a virus evolves, it learns not to kill its host. So it basically does successful replication without being toxic. So for example, this is an example of a meme, Barack Hussein Obama. And so this is like a word tree, right? Barack Obama is a funny name. Barack Obama is an un-American name. These are all memes, right? Barack Obama pals around with terrorists. Barack Obama is scary. Barack Obama is a socialist. He wants to redistribute your wealth. Barack has the same name as Saddam Hussein. Osama, Obama sounds like Osama. So all memes, they all have associations. So for example, Joe Sixpack, the average real American, in other words, white, beer drinking, working class, not college educated. Joe Sixpack, of course, doesn't just drink a six pack, and even if he did, he's still a binge drinker. Joe Sixpack don't drink no six pack. And he don't have a six pack either. So why is that necessarily a good thing? Joe the plumber. Obama and the Beer Summit. So memes are all over. So their constructs are memes of addiction. That's why I talked about enantiodromia, that which arises from its opposite. Problems create solutions. So solution to the problem creates new problems. And the cure to the disease is in the disease. And the way you, in which you see the problem is the problem. So part of where the message in terms of mimetics and um, transformation <clears throat> is you start looking at the memes that kind of guide your behavior and your identity and you start reforming them if they're not working for you. So for example, culture itself is a virus. So there's like three ways of looking at culture. So first of is the melting pot and basically where all the differences in America get put in the flame of opportunity and freedom gets applied to the melting pot and it gets poured out into the mainstream and all the differences have magically disappeared. That's basically the immigrant model, right? Then there's a salad bowl model where you can have several different kinds of tomatoes, several different kinds of lettuce, carrots, beets, carrots remain carrots, beets remain carrots. Beets, they can flavor and color each other, but they remain essentially the same. The mimetic paradigm that I, I believe I created because I did, never saw anybody with it is basically the viral mimetic paradigm where culture is a virus and it changes depending on who it's doing. So for example, The idea that, let's see here. Ah, it's later. So transforming means this. 
you understand the survival conditions that create the memes that run you and you choose to change the core and start acting in a different way. Start transforming. So it never might have occurred to you to stop drinking caffeine and then go through caffeine withdrawal. Might never have occurred to you to modulate your diet to see how that affects your mood. So already you've st suddenly started to change. So there will be more about transformation next week. Let's roll music, and I will see you next week, hopefully with your re midterms returned. Not yet.